Well, welcome to another episode of WA This Week. And look, this is our Christmas wrap-up episode. Uh, so prospectively, happy Christmas, everyone. Um, but uh, certainly a fascinating year in politics in Western Australia. We've got a McGowan government, and they don't even call it a Labor government anymore. It's just a personality cult now. The McGowan government... Um, with a massive surplus, complete control of parliament. And it's just unfortunate that everywhere we look in the major areas that the state government is responsible for, complete incompetence on that government's part in managing the affairs of the state. You know, we started the year, um, well, hopefully with a bit of optimism, and that is the borders opening. And uh, many of you, I think, would remember, and perhaps some people try and forget, just the cruelty of the separation of families that occurred during that time. Now, we all understood why the borders were closed at the start. It made sense because no one knew what was going to happen with COVID, but it became apparent after a relatively short period of time that, uh, in fact, we could manage uh, people moving interstate um, and coming into the country um, as long as we did that sensibly, as long as people quarantined. And yet we had the most horrendous stories of, of mothers separated from their children, uh, of people not able to see their dying relatives, dying parents, um, of, again, uh, grandparents not able to visit their children uh, who've, who've just had babies uh, and so on. And, and that was completely unnecessary. It was completely ad hoc. We heard of people from the top end of town seemed to be able to freely move wherever they wanted to go, overseas or interstate, and yet there was such cruel separation uh, of families. And, and we did say that the government could have opened that border much sooner than they did. Look, uh, at least it was open, and I think we've all enjoyed it. And those businesses that rely on interstate travel um, certainly have benefited now, and you can see that improving for those businesses. One of the consistent themes across the year has been cost of living pressures. What we have seen um, around the world and, and in Western Australia in particular is very high inflation, over 7% um, in Western Australia, and that's putting enormous pressure on households. Now, one of the things we said was, look, we know the, the state government can't control global affairs and, and there are international pressures that affect inflation, but there are also local pressures. One of those are government fees and charges. Now, here's a state government. Uh, they've got cumulative surplus, surpluses over their term of over $20 billion. This year, over $6 billion in surplus above budget forecast. And yet, they still put up all your fees and charges. And at the time, they were putting them up above the rate of inflation. And... We said to the government, why are you doing this? You've got this massive surplus. Houses are under, you know, households are under enormous pressure. House prices are up. Rentals in particular are up massively. But of course, the cost of food, the cost of fuel, all of those key costs that come into your household have increased and were increasing quite dramatically. And yet the government persisted with the uh, increase in those fees and charges. Now, they had a little gimmick. They gave a $400... Uh, and what I've described as an election bribe, and this was for the federal election. Just before the federal election, they gave a $400 rebate through power. Uh, but the reality is all of the underlying fees and charges have gone up. Next year, you're going to be hit with that increase plus the increase for that year as well. So a double whammy, which I think most households are really going to struggle with. And as I said, you know, for the government, we understand over time that they'll have the same inflationary pressures. But this year, they could have given you cost of living relief, and they didn't do it. Um, another consistent theme, and this has been a consistent theme across this government, is the whole um, issue of just the chaos in our health system. You know, this is a the, this um, McGowan government, as they describe themselves, is when Roger Cook, who was the former health minister, was the opposition. Uh, shadow for health. He described a thousand hours of ambulance ramping, and that is the amount of time ambulances spend waiting outside hospitals before they can transfer patients. He described a thousand hours as a crisis. Well, this government has consistently been up around five or six thousand hours uh, of ambulance ramping. Um, you know, this year, over 60,000 hours. Uh, you know, it, it equates to a, 
an ambulance, uh, about seven ambulances outside a hospital every minute of every day. It's just appalling. And why is it? It's not because the ambulance service, which the government have been attacking because of uh, a, a supporting a union campaign to try and take over that service, um, but uh, it's because hospitals cannot accept the patients. And what we hear is even when patients get into hospitals, they're left in corridors for hours, even days before they can actually get into a proper hospital bed. Now, these aren't people with a, you know, just an aching tooth or a bit of a headache. These are people who are seriously ill. They've needed an ambulance to come to the emergency department and they can't get into the hospital. You know, a complete failure of this government, a complete failure to stay on top of health. And it goes to every part of health, whether it's elective surgeries um, or the like, just complete chaos uh, in the hospitals. Law and order, another one of the key portfolio areas for any state government. Uh, what we've seen in this state in the term of this government is a 20% increase in violent crime. But any of you that live in the regional areas know that it's vastly worse than that. I mean, effectively, if you go north of Geraldton, it's fair to say that there are many communities that are almost lawless. And uh, the new member for North West Central, Mem Beard, who's just come into Parliament from Carnarvon, you know, has just been giving some harrowing tales in Parliament on the uh, enormous level of crime in Carnarvon. And we've got a police minister who says nothing to see here. No, there's no crime problem in Carnarvon. Uh, we've got a minister for community services that says, no, no, we've got everything under control um, because the crime is carried out mostly by kids, juveniles that that come from families, typically families that are having, having problems and struggles. Uh, and, and she says there's nothing to see there. And yet in the communities, and, and, and those of you that I'm speaking to who come from those regional areas know it, because you live it every day, of just an escalating level of violent crime. And again, we've got a government that has completely failed to deal with this effectively. They come into parliament, they announce their great programs, but they don't achieve anything. We've got a police minister who's made multiple announcements about he's increasing the number of police. And yet what we've seen between the middle of the year and now is a decrease in the number of police. They're not meeting their recruitment target of 950 new police. And in fact, police are leaving in droves, you know, anywhere to double to three times the rate, depending on the, the uh, age range of the police uh, that you see than has ever been seen before. And, uh, and I might say the worrying trend is that it's senior police who are leaving those experienced officers that we all rely on to keep our community safe. Why? Because there's a fundamental cultural problem in the police force and the Minister for Police is failing to deal with it. The, um, another area which has come up and look, no surprise given the previous record of Labor governments in this state is education. I mean, health, law and order, education. I mean, these are the key areas uh, for any state government, you would think. Um, in education, now we've got a situation, uh, an enormous number of vacancies in senior school teachers. The real prospect of, of next year of not having adequate teachers, uh, enough teachers to uh, staff every classroom. And, and we hear these, these weasel words from the state government, how are they dealing with, oh, they're going to do some different things, they're going to do some online stuff, they're going to um, oh, change the way they teach. What, what we're hearing is what they're going to do is increase the size of classes, put more kids in classrooms. And those of you who are parents with children, you know that larger classrooms mean that your child has less chance of learning in their classroom. And, uh, you know, let's say, I hope it's wrong. I hope that the government succeeds. But again, fundamental incompetence on the part of this government. And this is exactly what happened in previous late governments, Labor governments. When the Premier was the, uh, was the education minister uh, back in uh, the previous um, Gallup government era, you know, exactly the same situation. This is a government, they, the Labor Party, they love announcements, they love... You know, they've got more journalists employed than any of the agencies, uh, any of the newspapers or television stations in Perth. So they love all the announcements, but utterly incompetent at delivering uh, the services, the key services that you require in this state. You know, and now we've got this situation. You'd all remember during COVID, you had the Premier out there standing shoulder to shoulder with the police and saying what marvellous job the nurses and the midwives were doing in the hospitals. And what do we have now? We have a state government that is, is trying to stare down nurses and midwives and police 
over um, a fair pay and condition offer. Now, <clears throat> and, and really saying inappropriate things about them, we've got this unseemly attack on the uh, nurses' union uh, that's going on at the moment to try and undermine their negotiation position. We have a government that was happy to say that they were standing shoulder to shoulder and relying on the nurses, midwives and police during the COVID crisis. But then when it comes to offering fair wages and conditions, and can I say the key for both of those services um, is, and it's very clear from the people, the lack of respect that they are shown in their workplace. And that comes from the top. The fish rots from the head. And it's very, very clear that the government is not sincere uh, in relation to the way it deals with, those, with police, nurses and midwives. Um, and it's uh, very clear that, that they quickly turn on them um, once the crisis period is passed. Um, you know, just so many areas to cover and, and you know, we don't want to go on um, for too long. But, you know, dodgy dealings in relation to land, and that was exemplified no more than the Landgate sale. Uh, Landgate, a government uh, agency, owns land at, in Midland or did own land at Midland. I won't go dwell on this in great detail, I've covered it before in podcasts, but land that industry sources estimated was worth around $100 million, sold for $17.3 million. Hamish Hasty from WA Today has been doing some excellent work. I'd encourage you to go online, look up his articles, because every time he peels away a layer on this deal, it just gets murkier and murkier. And the government have completely failed to provide any reasonable answers for how they've gone about that sale. Uh, look, as I've said, I hope it's just gross incompetence. Uh, that would be the best possible uh, answer the government could uh, give, I guess. In, in Let's hope it's nothing more than that. But either way, the government needs to come clean on that deal. But it's not just that deal. Um, the way this government deals with your, your public land and the way those deals are structured, it's completely secret, it's not transparent, and it's not, well, in fact, it's certain that the deals that they're doing are not in the interests of the taxpayers and the ordinary Western Australians who actually own that land. The government doesn't own it, it's on your behalf. Um, we've got the um, federal government, and I, I don't normally cross over into federal issues, but the new industrial relations bill that the Federal Labor Party is putting through Parliament, and they now believe they've got support from the crossbench in the Senate. These laws are going to plunge us back to the industrial chaos in the 70s. And, you know, sometimes you might get accused of uh, using a bit of uh, hyperbole in, in, in uh, describing things, but there is nothing more certain. This legislation allows patent bargaining, and that is where it goes from one employer to the other. It allows unions to pick off the weakest employer, get a new set of terms and conditions, and then use that as a basis to apply to all other industries. It allows the unions to strike deals with the top end of town, the large, uh, large companies that can typically afford uh, to pay more, but then the small and medium-sized companies that the, their competitive advantage is they're nimble and fast and they may offer their employees other conditions, but, but they you know, can't necessarily offer the high pay rates of the big companies. Um, they're all going to be forced to pay the same amount of pay across industry-wide awards. What does that mean? It means those small and medium-sized companies get squeezed out because the big companies take everything. Um, and that means all of the people that are employed, all of those family companies get destroyed. You know, it is, and also um, the Australian Building and Construction Commission is being abolished. Now, some of you who are old enough to remember would cast your mind back to the 70s, to the thuggery uh, of the building unions and just what that meant. Complete chaos in the building sector. You had unions that would do you know, particular sweetheart deals with one major builder and then every other builder got squeezed out who wouldn't come to heel uh, in terms of dealing with the union. That's where we're heading. This, this federal Labor government is, is bringing that legislation in. Who's their number one cheerleader? The number one supporter for that legislation in Western Australia? None other than Premier Mark McGowan. Now, this is someone who's beat his chest and through the COVID era said he's standing up for Western Australia, but he's come out publicly to support th this appalling legislation uh, and, and said that he thinks it's the right thing to do, it's appropriate legislation. 
So he's not standing up for Western Australia. He's not standing up for those small businesses, the small family businesses. And ultimately, he's not standing up for the ordinary uh, worker in Western Australia, the, the workers in Western Australia that lead to employment, because this will lead to unemployment and chaos in our economy. It's really retrograde, and the Premier should stand up for Western Australia. Happy to do it before the election over COVID, um, but is missing in action, or not just missing in action, championing this action um, now. He should, she should think about this and go hard to stand up for Western Australia and oppose that legislation. Um, perhaps the most um, farcical thing that we've seen in this whole year, Western Australia will literally be bringing coal from Newcastle. You know, we heard rumours of this a while ago. Now it's been absolutely confirmed. Over 100,000 tonne of coal coming into Western Australia. Um, it'll come from the port of Newcastle. Uh, and, and that coal, why are we importing that coal? You'd ask the question, wouldn't you? Coal reserves in Collie, I think they're estimated around 2 billion tonnes. Proven mineable reserves, over 300 million tonnes. Two coal mining companies in Collie. Uh, and, uh, and yet here we are in a position of this state bringing in coal because our power stations are running out of coal. This is a complete farce. We've got an energy minister, Bill Johnson, uh, who's also the mines minister. Now, uh, Bill Johnson, he loves to lecture people. He loves to lecture journalists. He loves to lecture myself and colleagues in parliament about how clever he is and how he knows everything and how he's on top of everything and no one knows as much as him. Well, if he's so clever, how are we in this farcical situation of having to import coal into the state? A complete failure by the Minister for Energy, the Minister for Mines, uh, to guarantee energy security. And on top of that, um, the government have announced the early closure of the coal-fired power stations in Collie. Now, industry, the, the, the industry uh, people that actually use, or the businesses that actually use the gas that comes down that pipeline, they've done some detailed work on this. Um, when those coal-fired stations are closed, we will rely on gas to provide the backup power. Those times when the sun's not shining and there's no wind and you don't have coal, we're going to need a massive increase in the amount of gas that comes down that pipeline from the northwest to provide um, gas for our, our gas turbine power station backups. Now, it is physically impossible to get the required volume of gas down that pipeline. Now, the government have said, and this again, the, energy for minister, uh, the Minister for Energy, Bill Johnson, who loves to tell us all how clever he is, uh, is saying nothing to see here. What did we see the other day? Um, the Santos plant, uh, gas plant on Varanus Island has had a disruption because one of the gas wells uh, has got a leak and it has to be shut down. Now, the Minister for Energy said that will have no impact on customers and no impact on businesses in Western Australia. The very next day, uh, the Yarra ammonia plant, uh, which is up on the borough, the largest ammonia manufacturing plant in Australia, uh, an export business that makes money for our state, had to shut down because it didn't have enough gas. What that highlights is, is the fragility of our gas network. So we've got a minister who's, again, saying nothing to see here, the minister who's in charge, but in fact, we've got major issues in that network. Look, I think perhaps on the a sadder note um, to end the year, that the complete debacle at Bankshire Hill, and I don't have time to go into this in, in great detail, but I think anyone who, who has any compassion in their body would uh, know that, that the situation in Bankshire Hill has just been terrible. Now, we've made no bones about this. You know, if, if you've got you juveniles who are committing really, um, you know, dangerous crimes, violent crimes against the people and, uh, and the like, clearly you have to uh, have some way of stopping that. And incarceration is the case for children that are, have become habitual criminals and committing serious crimes. You have to protect the community. We don't, we don't resile from that. Um, and that has to be done. But when those children are in a correctional facility, it can't be about punishment. It has to be about trying to turn those kids' lives around. You know, my colleague, uh, the Honourable Peter Collier in the Upper House, through questions in the Upper House, revealed um, that, that over 25% of the capacity of Casuarina prison is filled with kids who've, who've gone into adulthood hood and effectively have gone straight into Casuarina prison because of adult crime. So they haven't had their lives turned around. They've just gone from a, a, a terrible youth to going to have a terrible adulthood and probably spend a large part of their adult life incarcerated in a jail. 
this is just a terrible uh, outcome for the state. But I guess the, the most ridiculous thing is the Premier reckoned he was going to solve all of that problems with a 90-minute uh, session with a group of people that he hand-picked. Coming out at the end of that, um, uh, Professor Fiona Stanley wrote an op-ed in the Western Australian newspaper where she made some comments. The Minister for Energy, again, or the Minister for Corrective Services in this guise, the Honourable Bill Johnson, uh, it was upset by those comments. Then he's seeking legal advice with the potential to sue a former Australian of the year. Didn't just go and have a chat to her and say, look, I think that was wrong. Perhaps you could correct the record. But is going down this path. I mean, what a farcical situation. You know, that is definitely a minister. The, the Premier's got the chance to reshuffle his cabinet. He needs to have a serious look at the, uh, the Minister for Energy, the Minister for Corrective Services, uh, the Honourable Bill Johnson, because uh, he clearly is not on top of his brief. But there's a whole raft of ministers, as I've illustrated through my uh, discussion today, um, who, are, who uh, should be in the lens of, of getting moved on. Look, um, not, not enough time to cover all of the topics, um, but um, on a happier note, look, I, I really hope everyone has a, just a fantastic Christmas, a great New Year. Stay safe, you know, be careful on the roads if you're out, um, don't drive tired. It's, it's that time of the year where we unfortunately see a spike in accidents on the road and, and just make sure you uh, just take time to spend it with the people that you love, the people that you care about, so that we're all refreshed for the new year. Um, look, you can, uh, and I do thank you for listening to the to the to this uh, broadcast. Um, you can get this podcast if you want to share it with anyone. You can get it on any of your favourite podcast apps, um, and also you can get the video. You can get it on uh, YouTube, um, Spotify, or Facebook. Just search Dr. David Honey. Please share it with your friends. Get the message out there. And um, otherwise, um, as I say, please have a fabulous Christmas and a great New Year, and stay safe. Thank you.